Welcome, everybody. It's delightful to see you all. And uh, remarkable, uh, in a funny way, for the two of us to be here, Alan. I, I feel as if you ought to be tutoring me for one of our uh, final exams, which you used to do. Uh, we've known each other for over 50 years, as you've just heard. And um, it's, I don't know how that uh, came to be. Uh, but you say in your book <clears throat> that you were a dreadful student uh, until you went to college, that during elementary school and secondary school you were a disaster. What, uh, what turned it around? I don't know. I wish I knew. Uh, in elementary school and high school, I was a C and D student. I have in my book an actual photograph of my senior semester report card with a 60 in physics, red circle around it, a 60 in math, red circle around it, 65 in history, and I managed to squeeze out an 80 in uh, English. So I had a 67 average, and I was actually suspended from the varsity basketball team, not for athletic deficiencies, but for academic deficiencies. And uh, I went to a yeshiva, a Jewish parochial school, <clears throat> And my principal, who's an Orthodox rabbi, called me in one day and says, Dershowitz, you know, you got a big mouth, but not much of a brain. He said, you have to figure out something you can do with your life where you talk a lot, but you don't have to think a lot. Uh, he said, you could be a conservative rabbi, uh, or you could be a lawyer. I wasn't smart enough to be a rabbi, so I became a lawyer. And um, so at age 16 and a half, I was a failure. Uh, and by age 17 and a half, I was at the top of my class in Brooklyn College with straight A's. I never got a B. And um, I think the reason was I didn't change as much as the school changed. Uh, I went to a college where anything went. You could ask any question. You could raise any issue. Uh, whereas the high school I went to, you were punished, essentially, for raising questions that were heretical. So I really do think that Brooklyn College saved me. Look, if I had had better grades in high school, you and I would have been classmates, because I would have probably tried to get into Columbia. I was turned down by Columbia, wise decision based on my grades. And I was so lucky that Brooklyn College was a free school and had an exam that you could take to get in. So I think that's what turned me around. Also, one person told me I was smart, a camp counselor, who I had a lot of respect for, told me I was smart, and I said, no, 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 I just have a good memory. He said, no, no, you're actually smart. And that sunk in and gave me a little confidence. You once, uh, you once told me that you had two fees <coughs> um, for your legal work, outrageous and free. Uh, tell us about a case or two in each, uh, in each category. Yeah, well, I do half of my cases free, and um, I've represented lots and lots of people. For example, I represent soldiers. Uh, and first responders, and police officers, people who, in my view, perform an enormous public service but are underpaid. And so I have a policy of representing them for free. And in my book, Stand Your Ground, I talk about representing Colonel Steele, the hero of Black Hawk Down in Mogadishu, when he was being investigated for creating an atmosphere around which some of his soldiers may have acted irresponsibly. And I represented him free. And, we got the charges uh, dropped. I represented a woman some years ago who was locked in a mental hospital. And it was a case where her family was trying to be rid of a, a nuisance rather than a true case of mental illness. And just the other day, I was thinking about that, she came up to me at a book signing and reminded me that I had, quote, saved her life. Uh, two young boys on death row uh, who were innocent. Uh, their father had committed the murders for which they were sentenced to death. And I represented them. That case took me nine years. Uh, Anatoly Sharansky, I represented him. Somebody once asked me uh, what my biggest fee was. And I said, Anatoly Sharansky. And they said, well, we didn't know he had any money. And, and I said, he didn't. But when I was able to help him get free and return to his wife and family, and he whispered in my ear the Hebrew blessing, Baruch Matir Asurim, blessed are those who help free the, free the imprisoned. That was the biggest fee uh, I'll ever get. In terms of the outrageous fees, why not? If I'm representing billionaires, um, why not charge what the going rate is? I use my billionaire cases to fund my poor cases, and it works out. Uh, you said that the, um, 
greatest legal blunder of the 20th century it was committed by uh, President Clinton's lawyer in the Paula Jones uh, right. case. This is uh, Robert Bennett. Right. Could you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I, I just to this day cannot imagine why the President of the United States, who had his choice of any lawyer in the country, would pick a lawyer who didn't tell him that he had the option not to have to testify about his sex life in the Paula Jones case. All he had to do was default the case. And that is not settle the case, but just go to the clerk's office, have his lawyer, deposit a check for $750,000, which was the amount of the lawsuit. The case is over. But he never told the president that he had that option. He only told him he could either settle the case, the other side didn't want to settle on positive terms, or he would have to litigate. And when I told the president that, he was shocked. He didn't know that he had this option. And so I called Robert Bennett on the phone. I said, is it true that you didn't tell the president of this third option? He said, absolutely, it's true. I said, well, why not? He said, it would have been a stupid idea for him to default the case. I said, isn't that his decision to make, not your decision? Well, uh, that's what uh, Robert Bennett didn't tell the president. And I think that was the greatest legal blunder. It got the president impeached. It almost got him indicted. And the idea that a president has to testify about his sex life is so beneath the dignity of the presidency, doesn't mean the president should have done it. Uh, he wouldn't have had to testify if he didn't do it. But if he didn't testify and simply said that the dignity of the presidency does not permit me to talk about anything private, I think he would have survived. Uh, but that's his decision to make. A lawyer's job is to tell the client what the options are. In Taking the Stand, your, your new book, you talk about the only crime that you've uh, ever committed. <laughs> You want to tell that story? Well, actually, since I wrote the book, I may have committed another one. So let, let me be very clear. They both involved my son. Um, my son was 10 years old, and uh, he had a very serious brain surgery. He's fine, but he had very serious brain surgery, and he was 10 years old. And he um, recovered very well, and he went back to work. He had always worked selling newspapers in Harvard Square. And one day, two thugs from Somerville came and beat him up, mugged him for his money, his you know, $3 or $5 that he had, and beat him in the head and knocked a tooth out. And uh, um, then when, and he, they were arrested, and when they um, met in, in court again or some other time, the two kids came over to my son and said, unless you drop the charges, next time we're going to throw you in front of the train. And so I saw these kids in Harvard Square, and I walked up to them. And I mentioned the name of a man I was representing at the time. Uh, I was representing him only on a marijuana charge, but he was a notorious hitman for the mob. And he killed his clients in particularly brutal ways. And all I did was mention the name of my client and tell these kids how much my client admired me and made it clear to them that if they touched my son again, my client would find out about it. These kids got down on their hands and knees and begged me not to do it. I probably committed a crime. But the next one was just recently, uh, a few uh, months ago, when my son, again, had uh, a problem, went to the hospital. And when he got out, he was opening a cab door. I was with him. And a woman was sitting in the cab, and she dropped her bottle of wine and it broke. And uh, my son immediately said, oh, let me pay for it. I apologize. But a man came around and started to punch my son. And here I am, the 75-year-old guy, and I reared back and I punched him in the jaw, knocked his glasses off, and he ran away. Uh, and probably that was assault, not with a deadly weapon, but assault. And I'd do it again in a minute. Uh, anybody attacks my children, my loved ones, uh, no matter how old I am, I'm going to respond. Hey, I grew up in Brooklyn. We were street kids. We learned how to fight back. What, what has been the strangest or perhaps the single funniest moment you've had in court? Well, I won a case once by telling a joke. Um, I was representing the movie I Am Curious Yellow. Any of you remember that? You could probably watch that on, um, on general television today. You'd probably get maybe an R rating, maybe a GP rating. But uh, the man who showed that film was sentenced to a year in jail. 